Hello everyone, in today's video this will be an hour's worth of old stories I have previously narrated on my channel, so this will be a compilation. But without further ado, let's get straight into these stories. I recently discovered this sub and immediately thought of this experience that happened to me two summers ago, while I was cat sitting and house sitting for an older couple I met in a French class I was taking. This couple lived near a busy corner with a bookshop coffee shop, a grocery store, and a movie theater in a nice neighborhood of a big city. For all these reasons and more, I was pretty excited to house sit there. My own apartment, where I lived with my boyfriend and my own cat, was about a 10 minute drive to 40 minute walk further up the street in a quiet, residential area with nothing much around it. Now, my own cat is vocal and super social. Because of this, we try never to leave him alone at night because he will literally cry for us all night. We're always slightly paranoid that he's going to get us evicted due to noise complaints from neighbors. We lived on the top floor and you could literally hear him crying from the bottom floor and outside if the door to the building is open. So my boyfriend and I decided that he should stay at the apartment with our cat while I was house sitting. My boyfriend drops me off at the house and I settle in with my luggage. Look around the surprisingly large three-story house and then decide to walk over to the grocery store to pick up some food for the next few days. As I'm walking home with my bag of groceries, I notice this man, extremely tall and gaunt, with a head full of long, shaggy hair, walking parallel across the street watching me. I'm only about two houses away from the place where I'm staying, so I sit down on the edge of the wall as though I'm taking a break and call my mom, trying to keep an eye on him surreptitiously from the corner of my eye. This man stops behind a pole across the street and continues to watch me. I tell my mom this guy seems to think that a pole hides him from my view, but that I can see him from there, standing still as a statue, just watching me. I don't want him to know where I'm staying, so we continue chatting and eventually, I turn my full gaze on the man to let him know that I see him watching me. For a moment he doesn't react at all, then he just sort of meanders on down the small street and I watch him turn the corner and disappear from my view. I tell my mom and gather my groceries and walk cautiously down the street, keeping an eye out for him as I near the place I'm house sitting and don't see him. I dart in through the back door next to the garage as quickly as I can and breathe a sigh of relief once I'm inside. I tell my mom everything's good and I put away the groceries and forget about the entire incident. The couple has a beautiful library, so I continually spend the rest of the afternoon and well into the evening just perusing their walls of books and selecting a few to bring upstairs to the guest bedroom on the third floor. I'm playing some music and just enjoying the quiet downtime all to myself. I finally get sleepy, text my boyfriend goodnight, and fall asleep. I wake up shortly thereafter after a terrifyingly realistic dream that this gaunt man has walked into the room, trailing his fingertips along my body. The room is dark, all the window blinds shut, and my body goes completely still. Half positive that it wasn't a dream and that he had somehow broken in, it was waiting in the shadow. I quietly reach underneath my pillowcase for my phone, I always keep my phone tucked under my pillow, and it's not there. My panic rises, and my mind overreacts. He's here and he's playing a game with me. He took my phone. He's somewhere in the house. I desperately begin to pat around my bed as quietly as possible, searching beneath the other pillow for my phone. Not there. I think, surely he'll hear me if I get out of my bed to look. But I suddenly remember that I left my laptop next to me on the bed and I open it, quickly sending text after text to my boyfriend through iMessage until he wakes up. I tell him I can't find my phone, had a bad dream, and I'm super anxious. With him awake and responding, I get the courage to flip on the lamp and get out of bed. I search around the floor, thinking my phone must have fallen while I was sleeping. Nope, not on the floor. Finally, as I search the bed frantically, I find it atop the covers on the other side of the bed. Weird, but I suppose I must have knocked it across the bed or something. I don't sleep well the rest of the night, hearing noises from across the three floors of the creaky stairs and house, thinking anyone could break in through the patio door across from my room. All they'd have to do is get to the balcony and wake up the next morning exhausted. The next day, I'm sitting in the living room at their piano practicing. I'm an opera singer, and I was mostly excited about this house sitting because I'd get the chance to sing without worrying about apartment neighbors complaining, with the blinds open. There are some kids riding their bikes, neighbors with dogs, the usual. I'm enjoying my afternoon when I notice there's an odd, run-down, dilapidated, dark house nearly diagonal to this one which doesn't fit in at all with the otherwise nice neighborhood. Gaunt man walks out of it and sits on the porch. My stomach drops. I call my boyfriend and tell him that the creepy guy apparently lives across the street. 
I shut the blinds facing that way so that he can't see me and retreat to the other side of the house with the kitchen. I spend the rest of the day chilling, convincing myself that I'm overreacting, that everything is fine and I don't need to worry. Nonetheless, come nightfall, the house seems just way too large, with too many entrances and the bottom floor is so far away that I worry the noise wouldn't carry up to the top floor if someone did break in. Naturally, I cannot sleep at all. I end up retrieving a knife from the kitchen and stashing it under my pillow. Noises keep me up. Creaks. Odd sounds. Around 11pm, I call my boyfriend and beg him to come stay with me, assuring him that our cat could survive one night without us. He drives over and pulls into the garage. I come unlock the hall door from the garage to let him inside. I still don't sleep well, but at least I get some sleep with him here, feeling a little safer. He gets a little weirded out about the knife under the pillow and tells me to put it back where I got it. I stash it in the bedside drawer, just in case. The next day, I pull it together and tell him he doesn't need to stay. I'm clearly overreacting. Then comes nightfall and the prolifera of odd noises. I decide I can't stay in the guest room at the top floor anymore because I feel like I can't hear anything. I go down to the second floor and try to sleep on the couch in their media room. George of the Jungle's on TV and I try to fall asleep while watching that. Instead, I get more and more paranoid that I won't be able to hear anything over the movie and end up switching the movie off. I try to fall asleep again. Now I'm sure that I can hear noises from both above and below me. Not the cat who, every night, hid in a tote bag in their bedroom on the second floor and never made a sound except to hiss at me when we crossed each other's paths. I get no sleep, patrolling the entire house all night, finally falling asleep as the night sky tinged gray with dawn. The next day was my birthday and his little sister was flying up from across the country to spend a week with us. He couldn't stay the night with me anymore because she was still quite young and needed adult supervision, and I insisted that she stay at our place rather than have them come to the house I was at. Fortunately, my best friend had just returned from her trip, and we decided to have a birthday sleepover. I feel a little paranoid, but again, I'm able to get some sleep with someone else there and wake up a little more refreshed. She leaves, and I sit in the kitchen, which faces the street where Gauntman first saw me. Gauntman is across the street, walking and watching. I duck down against the wall below the window, placing my phone at the gap between the blinds with only the top of my head showing. Gauntman gets closer, still watching as I hit record on the video. I get several seconds of him watching the house until he suddenly seems to notice the top of my head or the phone and snaps his own gaze back to the sidewalk below him and walks on. My heart is pounding. Now he knows that I've watched him watching me again. Probably saw the phone recording or taking a photo and he lives right across the street, where he often sat on his porch for hours smoking with a couple of other men, facing my direction. The next few nights were a blur of me wandering around the house, checking closets and other closed spaces upon returning from going out, placing chairs against entrances so that I'd hear them scrape if they got moved, half sleeping in the media room, double checking windows, exhausted until the couple of hours of sleep I would get when the sky would tinge gray and I'd felt I'd survive the most dangerous part of the night. My best friend found out I wasn't sleeping at all and offered to stay with me for the last night. Boyfriend's little sister was still there so he couldn't. I accepted her offer, feeling foolish and overdramatic, but thankful. We stayed back in the guest room on the top floor, watching Parks and Rec quietly with the subtitles on, so that I could still hear the rest of the house. It was around 1am or so when a shrill, piercing siren suddenly echoed throughout the house. My best friend and I sat up in bed, paralyzed for a moment with fear and confusion. Did they say anything about an alarm? She asked me. No, I responded, hesitantly, wondering if I had missed something in the notes they had left. We stared at each other for another long moment. What should we do? She asked. I don't know, I said. We should shut the door and lock it, right? She was the closest to the door. She shut it quickly and locked it. I moved the nightstand in front of it, a pathetic barricade. The siren continued to wail throughout the house. Should we call the police? I asked my heart pounding into my mouth, opening the blinds with my hands and trying to peer through the dark street below. There was a window to the bathroom with the access from the balcony patio. I checked it, just to make sure yet again that it was shut and locked. We should probably call the police, or should we? She had already begun to call the police, telling them that we were house sitting and an alarm had just gone off. We were concerned about a man who had been watching me over the past few days and we were alone in the house. The police got our address and said that they would arrive soon. Suddenly, the alarm stopped. With the alarm off, we gathered the courage to remove the nightstand from the door and unlock it. I had Pepper Mace gripped tightly in my hand as we swung the door open, ready to confront whatever was out there. Nothing. No one. I checked the giant glass door a few steps away that led to the balcony patio. Locked. We made our way down the stairs, cautious, quiet. We finally made it down to the bottom floor when there was pounding at the front door. I hurriedly made it over to the door, 
removing the chair I had placed in front of it as quickly as I could, letting in two policemen. They identified themselves to the door. They came inside, asked me a few questions about this man, and then decided it was probably just a harmless homeless man. I didn't tell them that he lived across the street because I thought they'd accuse me of overreacting. Quote unquote, he was just walking home, not following you or watching you. End quote. They couldn't find a security system and told us that it was the fire alarm that had gone off, but they couldn't figure out why. After checking the house and finding no one, they left. I emailed the owners the next day to tell them what happened and that we had called the police to come check it out. They apologized that it happened and thought it was strange. I left the next day and politely declined house sitting for them when they asked again a few months later. We moved out of the city and across the country last summer. My boyfriend only recently told me that he and my dad, who had come up to help us move, had seen Gauntman walking across the street from our apartment and that last week before we moved. So Gauntman, even if you weren't stalking and watching me, let's not ever meet again. A couple years ago, one of my closest friends relocated cross-country with his long-term girlfriend to a work job he couldn't refuse. Only issue he had was that he did not want to fly his dogs out with them when they made the move since they'd be staying in a hotel for the first month. He was also a bit reticent to fly them out due to health concerns for both pets. By the time he located a home to rent, he was missing his dogs and made the request of his sister, another close friend, and myself to drive them to him in LA. Now we're Chicago folks, so the trip would be a long one, however. With the three of us to foot the near 30 hour drive, it would be a piece of cake. We left early and drove long hours. Along the way, it was decided between my friend and I that if we'd foot the majority of the drive ourselves, and if we needed to, we'd let our friend's sister do some driving. We were on a bit of a time crunch due to a snafu with the rental agreement, so we didn't have the luxury to stop very often past an 8 hour stay at a Denver LA Quinta Inn. As for the journey itself, it was relatively smooth, bearing getting pulled over right before entering Utah for driving for 2 miles in the left lane of an empty highway. Whoops. From that point, we made it through Utah, Arizona and Nevada without much trouble until we entered California in need of gas. I had been driving for the majority of the first day and tagged my buddy in after being pulled over. I remained in the shotgun seat as navigator, searching through the GPS for a fuel stop. We kept up our eyes peeled for road signs and discovered a sign pointing to Yermo Ghost Town or something along those lines, which had a mobile station. How wonderful. It was convenient too, as it was located almost directly off of the interstate. We rolled in on a little more than fumes when we approached the pumps. Normally, we let the dogs out at every rest stop, but having stopped not long before then, and with both dogs sleeping snugly in the back, I decided to pump gas without anyone else leaving the vehicle. My buddy pulled us up on the opposite side of a beat up green sedan with a short, plump gentleman who just turned in to approach the shop. I noticed a few other hoopties at the pumps, all unoccupied, and there were a couple of other cars parked up near the station, most likely belonging to the employees, so nothing seemed out of the ordinary until I swiped my credit card. The pump rejected my first swipe attempt, which I chalked up to a misread. I swiped again and the pump reads out, please see attendant. I was annoyed but we needed gas. I tapped on the window and told my buddy what I was doing and asked if anyone needed anything. After taking their orders for Gatorade and Marlboro Reds, I walked up to the store and made a mental note of how strange this gas station was. Kinda quiet, especially for one right off the interstate, but that's no matter. As I walked in though, more weirdness. First thing I noticed is that there are some boxes of chips just left on the floor, like someone was stocking shelves and just quit. As I veered to my right, I noticed that immediately there is no one milling about in this place. With the six cars beside my own out there, I felt like I would see someone. Things got even weirder when I realized that there was no one behind the counter, no customers or workers. And then it dawned on me. What had happened to the gentleman who was at the pub adjacent to mine? Surely they can't all be in the bathroom. This is where I began to feel this gnawing cessation in my stomach. Something isn't right. I have always been a person who felt like I could trust my instincts and those instincts were screaming at me just to get out of there. I want to run, but I hold back. I would look suspicious booking it out of a gas station that was empty and decide to just play it cool. Natural. Don't let your body language let on to how badly you're freaking out in your head. I was probably inside of this gas station for only a couple minutes when I left, but I stopped just before exiting to listen for something. Anything. A flushing toilet would have been a good sound, but nothing. As I exit the shop and see my car, I begin to feel dread. It's like that moment in a movie where the hero is about to make it to the end of their trial, but the celebratory fanfare disappears, and in that silence, something comes and strikes them down. I am about 25 yards from the car when I see this gentleman come out from around the side of the shop opposite of me. This is not the same man as I saw while pumping gas. He was larger and had a peculiar look on his face. 
The best way I could describe it, it was like Nick Cage's smile from Face Off before the titular act had occurred. I continued walking towards my car, but when I turned back to look at him, he was now walking towards me with a purpose. At this point, I noped my way back to the car with increased urgency in my step. And of course, my friend has the door to the car locked like a complete douche clown. There is also the 95 pound golden retriever sitting in my seat. Apparently, my travel companions did not notice how freaked out I was, or the creepy gentleman still walking in my direction. I punched the window and told him to unlock the door, to which he only half rolls down the window to tell me the dog was in my seat and they were afraid she'd jump out when I opened the door. I reached my hand and it threw the dog towards the back seat as hard as I could while my friend is just now realizing how freaked out I am. He started the car and drove off quickly. I took one last look back and saw the guy had stopped about a pump away from where we were, still with that same look on his face. We found another gas station further down the road, this time with a ton of people inside and out. After thoroughly creeping out my friends with the story as I pumped gas, we made our way back to the interstate, which meant passing that gas station again. It's been about 15 minutes since we pulled out initially, and we go silent as we notice that those very same cars are still sitting in the same spots where we had left them. After thoroughly freaking out for a few miles, I received a phone call from my credit card company about a $100 charge at a mobile station. The lady on the phone was really helpful in fixing the situation for me and was as entirely creeped out by the situation as we were. In the end, we made it to LA and had a great vacation, but it still bothers me as to what was going on at this little gas station off the highway and what was that smiling man's story. So, crazy smiling man and whoever else was lying in wait at the Yermo Ghost Town exit mobile station, let's not meet. I lived in New Mexico for several years before moving to the Midwest. My friend, Amy, and I, both females, would spend many days exploring the remote corners of the New Mexico, discovering abandoned ghost towns and enjoying the quiet, desolate beauty of the desert. One afternoon in March 2010, we were traveling from Ruidoso to Albuquerque. Always up for exploring, we took a back road rather than traveling the more direct highway. One leg of our journey had us on NM55. It's a remote, teeny tiny two-lane highway. We love those types of roads, up until that day. This part of New Mexico's flat and desolate desert, you can see for miles, and there's virtually nothing except dirt and rock between towns, and towns can be miles apart. So we were on NM55 going north. After a few minutes, we saw a white pickup truck up ahead of us, going the same direction. Suddenly, he stopped his truck sideways in the middle of the highway, blocking both lanes. We were about a mile away from him and as we got closer, we began to get uneasy. We could see no reason for him to do this. We were the only other vehicle out there and we began wondering if we should turn around rather than come up to him and have to stop. We were about a half a mile away from him when he pulled over to the opposite side of the highway but his truck was still pointed the direction we were going. We tried to relax a little. Surely, this guy was a rancher or something. Maybe he was checking something on his land. As we passed him, we noticed a few things. One, there was only one person in the truck, a middle-aged guy who never took his eyes off us, and two, he was talking into a walkie-talkie. A few seconds after we passed him, he pulled back onto the highway and started following us. But, he never got too close. He would get to within a few car lengths and then drop back a little and then speed back up again to within a few car lengths. We were getting nervous. We realized how alone we really were. We had seen no other traffic on that road and we hadn't told anyone about our great idea to take this detour. We checked our cell phones and neither one had signal. Typical for remote New Mexico, but scary given our present situation. Amy was driving and speeding up while I frantically checked the map, hoping to find a road that would have more traffic. There was no other road. We had to travel this one to get to the next town. Mountain air. Turning around to go back the other way didn't seem like a good option. After a few minutes, we saw another pickup truck coming towards us. He was going very, very slowly, maybe 20 miles per hour, if that. This pickup was old and beat up, whereas the one that was behind us was newer. Amy had us up to 75 miles per hour, which wasn't typical for us on these 55 mile per hour highways, and we blew by the old pickup. As we passed it, we saw that it was another middle-aged guy, and he was talking into a walkie-talkie. After the white pickup passed him, he pulled a U-turn and pulled in behind it. As we watched all of this, we could see the white pickup truck guy talking into his walkie-talkie. No doubt these two knew each other. We were being deliberately followed, and for the first and only time in my life, I felt hunted. They stayed right behind us. We watched for obstacles in the road. We truly thought old beat up pickup guy had set up a trap in the road and our vehicle would be disabled somehow. We talked about driving into the fields, we were in an SUV, but this was obviously their territory and we were afraid of what would happen if we went off road and got cornered. So we stayed on the highway. By now, white pickup truck guy was right on top of us. We could see him talking into the walkie talkie and he stayed right on our bumper. And old, 
beat up pickup truck guy was right on top of him. The three of us sped down the highway. The white pickup inched closer. His maneuvering and edging closer made it apparent that he was trying to bump us. I watched helplessly as he got to within inches of our back bumper. Amy floored it. We were passing 80 miles per hour and edging up to 90. The road was flat and deserted, but any little thing going wrong would have been catastrophic. We absolutely were not going to slow down or stop if we could help it. The white pickup pulled into the opposite lane and started to gain speed. The only thing we could think of was that he wanted to pass us and get in front of us. If he got in front of us and his buddy was behind us, then we'd be boxed in and trapped. We looked frantically at the rocky desert on both sides of us. Our only option was to off-road it. As we topped a small incline, we saw a sign that said Salinas Pueblo Missions National Monument, and it pointed towards a road on the left. And right at that moment, a blue pickup truck pulled out of the road and onto the highway in front of us. As we came up on the blue pickup, we saw the plate said U.S. Park Service. We looked at each other and then looked behind us. Both pickup trucks did U-turns and went the other way. We followed the blue pickup to Mountain Air and then made our way to Albuquerque. I don't know exactly what those guys' intentions were, but they weren't good. There is something seriously wrong out there. I notified the state police and they said they would keep an eye on things. So, let's not ever meet, or have anyone else ever meet, these guys. This story occurred roughly 14 years ago, when I was 12 years old and living in east side of an Australian rainforest. When I say rainforest, our house was on a 40 acre property surrounded by bush. The house itself was owned by a Swiss man named Hans. Occasionally, he would come down with his tractor and slash the long grass surrounding our house so we could access slightly more of the property in the summer. We lived about a 40 minute drive from the small town center. This meant that if we needed groceries, medical attention, or to contact our parents, say while we were at school, it would be a 40 minute drive before anything could be done. The house sat on the side of a large mountain, roughly three fourths of the way up so naturally most of the land we called home was strewn with valleys, nooks and hideaways. We had trails we could walk and they led to a stream and a small waterfall. It was a truly beautiful place, but considerably scary to me and my small siblings, one brother and one sister slightly younger than me. We knew our neighbors on both sides of the property. But because of the location of our house was pretty remote, our nearest neighbors were roughly a 10 minute drive away. One was a lovely old lady who used to wave to us when we got off the school bus before we made the trek to our house every day. I think our parents asked for her to keep an eye on us. The other was a middle aged man and his family. He was a real jerk who excavated around the bottom border where our properties met and continuously interrupted the stream and waterfall's clear flowing water supply. Lots of strange and creepy stuff happens when you're living in the middle of nowhere but one in particular involved a guy I certainly don't want to meet again. Being pretty removed from people, it was extremely rare that we ever got visitors we didn't know were coming. When people we didn't recognize turned up, it was usually because they were lost and needed directions. One day though, a man in a car came roaring down our driveway. I remember running inside to tell my dad someone weird was here. He immediately walked outside to see who this unwanted guest was. My dad goes outside to see what all the commotion is about while my mom keeps us inside being protective. The man has a large red fur dog in the back of his car that looks like a German Shepherd cross. It snarled at my dad but immediately cowered when this stranger told it to shut up. Our own dog named Millie was snarling and going ballistic while speed chained up to the house. Hi, my name is John. The way the man spoke was like he was a salesman, a really slick and smooth guy who on the outside seemed friendly but with the overtone of wanting something. My dad immediately responded with, So what are you doing out here then, John? The man was taken aback, obviously not used to dealing with someone as hostile as my dad. They then talked for a while and I could hear my dad talking with a sense of confusion about whatever this man had to say. I did however overhear my dad say, What are you thinking? Just call the cops. I found out later that the lovely old lady next to us had died. Apparently John was on the other side of her property and went to visit and found her dead. He also asked my dad if they should move the body to make it easier for police to investigate. This is obviously why my dad was telling the man to call the police immediately. Anyway, later that night the police showed up to take a statement from my dad and John, who was hanging around our house until the police arrived. I remember my dad pulling an officer aside and explaining that John wanted to move the body when he first arrived. The police left without any more questions as it looked like she had died from natural causes. John was still at our house. I found him to be a very unsettling person, the way he smiled, the dark of his eyes. He was unfamiliar, but acting like he was one of us. I remember it was a school night and I was trying to watch TV and he was playing songs on his guitar with my mom and my dad at the table. 
I was angry because he was ruining my shows and I told my mom I wanted him to go and I thought he was weird. She smiled and told me she felt the same and told me I should go to bed. The next day things seemed normal. Went to school, came home. Not seeing the familiar friendly face of the old woman stung a bit on my way past her house. It felt strange and I hoped that she knew her family loved her before she passed. I was a bit sad on the walk home. Until halfway down the driveway, I noticed John's car again and parked out the front of our house. I walked closer and was greeted by his dog, Rusty. He walked outside with my dad and I heard him call Rusty to his car as he was leaving. Apparently he was borrowing tools from my dad. He left and waved goodbye like he was someone that I was going to miss. Again, that sense of overfamiliarity made me feel uncomfortable. I didn't know this man. I didn't like this man and I was hoping he would never come down to our driveway again. My dad then pulled me aside and asked me what I thought of John. I labeled him a weirdo and told my dad I was hoping he wouldn't come back. For the second night in a row, when John returned dad's tools, he was sitting in our house playing guitar and annoying everyone. My mom and my dad were visibly unimpressed by the situation. I heard my mom and dad argue about him hanging around until eventually my dad told him he needed to leave as it was time for us to go to bed. He insisted it was early and tried to make an excuse to stay. I found that very odd. I was polite enough to know when someone didn't want me around so why didn't this man? Or if he did know, why wouldn't he leave? After ushering him out, my mom and my dad had a big talk in the room and my dad told us all that he didn't like John and that he was going to ask him not to come over anymore and if we saw John again, immediately to tell him. The next day was a Saturday so we were going to blow up our cheap inflatable pool and go for a swim as it was getting pretty warm. Around 11am, the sound of a car thundering down the driveway alerts me and I go outside. I run back inside to tell my dad that John is back. Just like the first time I ever laid eyes on John, my dad goes outside and we stay inside with my mom, watching and listening through a screen door. John again with his weird, overfamiliar smile and dark eyes greets my dad and is met with, Look, I don't know who you are, but I don't want you coming around here anymore. You scare my kids and my wife and I don't want you to come back, you understand? I didn't hear John's reply from his tone, but it sounded like he was confused and tried to reason with my dad. My dad wasn't having it and told him to go or he would call the cops. As he was leaving, my dad said, don't come back or you'll be sorry. This is where things truly get weird. As my dad lays this subtle threat on the man, his face completely changes one of rage. He glares at us in the house, sticks up his finger and speeds out of the driveway shouting profanities and churning up gravel, spraying it towards our house. My dad came back and told us we wouldn't be seeing John anymore, and if we did, we were going to call the police. I was relieved. This odd man made me feel uncomfortable in my own home, and the way he reacted when he left confirmed the feeling I got from him when I first saw him. I can't remember if it was the Sunday or the Monday after that day, but John did come back. He tried to reason with my dad and say sorry for whatever caused us to not like him. Before he even got out of his car, my dad said, if you don't turn around and leave, I'm going to smash your face in. He did just that. My dad then called the police to inform them of what happened. Apparently they were going to go and talk to John. I didn't hear any more of what happened to that conversation. A few weeks went by with no sightings or happening with John and we all felt like things were back to normal. This was until our mailbox had been tipped out of the ground and smashed, or possibly run over. I remember asking my dad what happened, but he wasn't about to give me any ideas. He later told me that he knew it was John after the way their last conversation ended. The next weekend after the mailbox incident, we went into town to get groceries and a fast food dinner as a bit of a treat, and when we came home down the driveway, my dad immediately stopped my mom from proceeding and said that something was wrong. Next to the carport where we parked our car at the back of the house, there was a window that opened to the bathroom. My dad must have spotted the window was missing. As we drove down, he got increasingly more tense until we all noticed the window was missing. I remember being confused in the back seat and not really knowing what was going on until I saw it. A man, dark eyes, and overfamiliar coming from the window that led to the shower. My dad was exploding with rage and he told my mom to rush down the driveway. The man proceeded to escape the window and run down the back of our property into thick shrubbery. My dad only being on one leg, let Millie loose as she was going ballistic tied up to the house. She raced down the grass engulfed hill into the darkness. She came back with nothing. My dad went out with his flashlight and couldn't find anything either. I'm not sure if anyone slept that night. None of our possessions have been stolen or even moved. We must have caught this man just as he was entering our house. The police came the next day and searched for fingerprints with no avail. My father was furious and again alerted them to John and his strange behavior. They told us they would look into it once again. That was the last time we heard from John that year. I had almost completely forgotten about him. 
and had the summer off to enjoy myself and get ready for high school. The school I went to was pretty large, considering where we were, but everyone seemed to know each other pretty well, including the teaching staff. Within my first week at the school, we were introduced to all the teachers and teacher aides. I was caught completely unaware when that overfamiliar, dark-eyed man from the previous year was introduced as a teacher aide. Except instead of John, he was introduced as Gregory something. I went into a little bit of a spin as I was trying to make sense of all of it. I was 100% sure that this man named Greg something was the same man who had introduced himself to my family as John. At that moment, so many things rushed into my head. What if he killed the old lady? What if he didn't live close by? What if he wanted to move the body so he could frame my dad? If he lied about something as critical as his name, what else was he lying about? What if police never even made contact with him? I was sitting there for a good 10 minutes trying to piece it together until the teacher called my name to bring me back to reality. That is when he noticed me. The look on his face when he saw mine was one I'll never forget. He immediately recognized me. He looked shocked. His eyes were wide and he said nothing, just staring at me. I could sense that he was now the one feeling uncomfortable and on edge. Later that day, I rushed home to tell my dad who I had found. He was shocked and repeatedly asked if I was sure. He went to the school the next day and discovered the man had put in for an indefinite leave yesterday and may not return. When we learned of the news, my dad told me to watch out and let him know should John or Greg ever return. So John, Greg, whoever you are, let's not ever meet again. When I was 14, I was asked to babysit my three younger cousins, aged 8, 4, and 1, in an extremely rural mountainous part of Pennsylvania. My aunt and uncle had a wedding to go over to about an hour away and wouldn't be back until very late. Their house was situated on a steep mountainside. Their back deck had a 15 foot drop onto a rocky hill below leading down to a river. Their closest neighbors were about a half a mile away. The closest main road was a mile away and at night there were no lights to be seen anywhere around them. Basically it was in the middle of nowhere and you would have to know where you're going to get there. You don't just accidentally end up there. My aunt and uncle left us with some pizza and their cell phone number next to their landline. This was the early 2000s and I didn't have a cell phone, but even if I did, I wouldn't get reception there anyway, and headed out. The baby was already asleep. The 4 year old wasn't feeling well and was quietly watching TV in the living room as he dozed off, and the 8 year old was playing guitar here with me up on the loft. The loft overlooked the living room to the left, where I could keep an eye on the 4 year old and there was a huge window that overlooked the driveway to the right. The description of the driveway is an important detail to the story. The road that led to their house ran straight into their forked driveway. It was a dead end road. The house was as far as you could go. Go to the left driveway, there is a large open carport and that's where my aunt and uncle and anyone who ever visited parked. The right driveway led down a very short but very steep hill to a large leveled out area and ended against the garage door that opened to the basement of the house. It was never used as a garage, but served as my uncle's man cave, and where he spent most of his time. Right beside the garage door, a normal door with a window so you could see right in. But this driveway was exclusively used by the kids as a play area because it was the only flat, yard-like area on the property. And being on a mountainside, there isn't much room to safely play otherwise. No cars ever drove down there. Ever. There are too many toys and bikes in the way, and friends and family knew this. It was about 10 p.m., pitch black outside, no moon to illuminate the area either. My cousin and I were still playing Guitar Hero when headlights caught the corner of my eye, and not my aunt's minivan headlights. Huge truck headlights with those roof lights you often see on jeeps or other off-road trucks. Not only that, the truck was going down the right driveway, the kids play area. This was not my aunt and uncle, this was not anyone they knew. Panic and dread filled my body. I was a small teenage girl, alone in an isolated house on a mountain at night with three children in my care. In a terrified voice, I asked my cousin, who is that Jake? Do you know whose truck that is? And then he looked panicked. No, I've never seen that truck before, he replied. I quickly ushered him downstairs, still unsure what to do, but the two little ones were sleeping down there and I wanted to make sure they were safe. I checked on the baby and then grabbed the phone to call 911, and then I started to hear the metal garage door being shaken violently. No one ever opened that garage door. More panic fills me. I hear them try the door beside it, the metal door knob jiggling. No one was actually knocking, it's not like they were checking to see if my uncle was down there. Plus, the lights were out. It was dark down there. They knew no one was down there. They were definitely breaking in. The door leading to the basement steps was right next to the phone, so I could clearly hear all this going on. I quickly turned the little lock on the doorknob just in case they did make it into the basement. My heart was practically jumping out of my chest. I'm talking to the 911 dispatcher as my 8 year old cousin clings to my arm. 
The operator is calm and trying to call me, but I knew it would be at least 30 minutes until a police officer could get up there. Assuming they didn't get totally lost on this mountainside in the pitch dark, I just kept thinking, we are dead, this is how I die. The operator asked for the number my aunt and uncle left me so she could have another dispatcher call them to let them know the situation. I turn around to grab the paper with the number on it and to my absolute horror, I see a man peering in a large sliding glass door. A huge, burly, but what had to been a 6 foot 4 man with long scraggly red hair and a big red bushy beard. And what made it worse, he was grinning at me. Grinning in a way that still scares me to this day. Meanwhile, I had to have looked like a terrified deer in the headlights. I was shaking so hard I could barely hold the phone. There was a second man behind him I couldn't see as well. I have no idea what he looked like, but he was equally as tall but a bit more lanky than the larger man at the sliding glass door. I screamed, oh god they're here, and before the 911 operator could say anything, my 8 year old cousin goes, Mr. Jim? His voice was very confused. It wasn't like my cousin was happy or even relieved to see him. I asked, do you know who that is? But before my cousin could answer, I turned my attention to the man in the door. I'm on the phone with the police, I shouted. I'm grateful he didn't try that door, because I do not think it was locked. The man stared at me hard for a moment, eyebrows furrowed, like deciding what he wanted to do next. But he then just backed away into the darkness. What seemed like an eternity later, I saw the truck lights back up out of the driveway and then back down the road until they disappeared. I was still really scared, and so was my cousin. He had only met that guy a few times, an acquaintance of his dad. It wasn't like it was a close family friend, and obviously, because again, he went down the wrong driveway. Visitors never go down that way. The 911 operator asked for a description of the man, then told me they'd gotten in touch with my aunt and uncle and they were on their way home. She stayed on the phone with me until the police officer showed up a bit later to make sure that the men were gone and they stayed with us until my aunt and uncle got home so they could ask them some questions. My uncle was furious, not at me for calling them home early but at this Mr. Jim guy. My aunt was mad at my uncle and told him to tell Jim to never come back. I didn't know at the time, but my uncle had a drug problem. I don't know what Mr. Jim or his accomplice were doing, or what they would have done if I wasn't on the phone with the police, but that grin was not a friendly one. It was sinister. And again, he also had to have known my uncle was not there, because the basement was dark. He would have seen through the windowed basement door. He had also tried lifting the garage door, something not even my uncle did. He intended to break into the basement. That much is clear to me. There is no other explanation. I never did babysit for them again, and I don't think I ever even went back up there because not long after, my aunt divorced my uncle and moved out. So Mr. Jim, the grinning mountain man who tried to break into the house where I was babysitting, let's not meet again. A few years back, my girlfriend and I, having hiked several other parts of the Appalachian Trail, decided we wanted to give the southern portion of Virginia's trail a shot. It is about 166 miles long, it runs through George Washington and Jefferson National Forest from Roanoke County to Parisburg and Gills County. This is definitely one of the more remote and less traveled parts of the trail, which is exactly what we were looking for. We gathered our gear and made our way to the start of the Virginia Creeper Trail to begin our journey. We had planned our journey to end at Damascus and figured that by the time we got there, we would be more than ready to get home to our own beds. It was early October and the changing of the leaves and colors were amazing. The air was crisp and cool, perfect hiking weather with beautiful scenery. The majority of the trip was pretty uneventful, just your typical hike, but our last couple of nights is where things got weird. On this portion of the trail, you're supposed to camp on the trail or a designated shelter. We didn't really want to run into other people and didn't want anyone coming up on us in the middle of the night. We decided to ignore those suggestions and find our own little spot off the trail. A little searching around and we found a spot a little ways off the trail in the middle of a small clearing. It was perfect. We set up camp, cooked some food, talked for a while, then snuggled up and went to sleep for the night. Somewhere around 2am, I was awoke by my girlfriend shaking me awake telling me, get your gun, someone is outside walking around our tent. She informed me that she woke up to what sounded like someone right outside the tent running a knife or something along the side while circling us. When hiking, I carry a 1911 with me. You never know exactly who or what you might run into when on such a long hike in a remote location. I got the 1911 out of my pack and then we sat silently, listening for any sounds. A few minutes of nothing but the breeze blowing through the trees and then I heard branches snapping. It sounded like it was a bipedal, based on the way the steps were paced. I turned on the flashlight and flooded the area with light. I thought I saw someone move behind a tree. I yelled out and told them to go away and that I was armed. I kept the light on the area with my gun drawn and slowly approached towards the area where I thought I saw the figure. Then, from my right, I hear what sounds like someone running away through the woods. 
I spin and face my light that way, and then from the original spot, hear who or whatever was there take off into the woods. There's no way I'm giving chase, so I return to the campsite. I tell my girlfriend about what happened, and I end up sitting guard outside the tent, in the darkness until daybreak. In the morning, I looked around a bit for signs of who or whatever it was, and I discovered a boot print in some soft, moist dirt not far from our tent. It wasn't mine and it wasn't my girl's. This freaked me out as it confirmed that someone, perhaps more than one, was skulking around our tent in the dark. I kept it to myself because I didn't want to freak my girl out any more than she already was. At this point, we were pretty deep in and still had two days left. That day we walked a little faster than normal and covered as much ground as possible. When it came time to set up camp, I found a spot near a cliff where we could place the tent in a small overhang and prevent anyone from coming up behind us. The whole day up to this point I had a feeling we were being followed. I had no confirmation of this as I hadn't seen or heard anyone else, but it was just a gut feeling. We set up camp and made some food, then retreated to the tent. I assured my girl that if I slept at all, it would be with one eye open. After a while, she drifted off to sleep and I stayed awake listening to the sounds of the woods at night. I was awake for a few hours, just waiting to see if anything was going to happen. At some point, I guess my exhaustion caught up with me and I drifted off. I woke sometime later to what sounded like someone going through our stuff outside the tent. I grabbed my gun and woke my girlfriend, shushing her to be quiet. From that faint glow of the fire, I could see someone's silhouette against the tent. There was really someone out there. I yelled out to them something along the lines of, We are armed, get out of here. They dropped what they were doing and bolted. I came out of the tent, gun drawn and ready to shoot someone. Our stuff was strewn all about. They had rummaged through quite a bit of our stuff. I walked to the edge of the woods in the direction of whoever was out there had fled. There was a creek nearby and I walked to the edge, where there was a small trail running alongside it. Down the creek I could see a light. It looked like a lantern the way it flickered. Then I saw three more emerge from the other side of the woods. I told my girlfriend to start packing up whatever she could and that we are leaving now. We packed up everything of value, left the tent and a few other items and headed back onto the trail, in the middle of the night. I kept hearing people talking off in the woods and hearing branches snap from quite some ways. I kept looking behind us every few seconds to make sure nobody was coming up behind us. It was completely nerve wracking. If something happened, we were still a long ways from anywhere and quite literally on our own. Since we hadn't seen another hiker the entire time we had been out there, I really felt we were in serious danger. We had been walking for quite some time when I heard something in the woods behind us. As we rounded a corner, I turned around and saw someone step out onto the trail and just stand there watching us. It was just as the sun was coming up and barely any light. I couldn't make out any features, just the silhouette. I stopped and looked at them for a second and asked them who they were and what they wanted. They just stood there silently, watching us and then turned and walked back into the woods. We picked up the pace and kept going, looking back every so often. We didn't see them again, but my gut told me they were still there for quite a ways. We eventually reached the end of the trail and got to where we had parked my girlfriend's car, extremely exhausted. We made it out of the Virginia woods without becoming a meal for some group of people of whatever knows what. I have no idea who they were or what they wanted. Maybe it was just someone messing with us, I don't know. But I'll never know because I will never be returning to find out. This happened over a decade ago, somewhere in northern Michigan during the summer. My friend Kathy, my boyfriend's half-sister May, and I drove down from our hometown to visit friends, and we were on our way back home in Kathy's bad little car. By bad, I'm talking this thing had engine problems, overheating problems, ignition problems, it was constantly falling apart. More than once, it had stalled or just stopped working in the middle of the street while we were trying to get somewhere, but Kathy thought we'd be fine since we hadn't had any problems with it on the way to our friend's house. It's a little past midnight and we're roughly an hour away from home. There's nobody on the road, dense woods on every side, no street lights, no moon. I can barely see past the windshield because I have a form of albinism, which leaves me legally blind in my left eye and with really awful vision in my right eye. My death perception is terrible, and I can't see more than a few feet ahead of me at most, but usually I can make out lights and other cars when they pass and sometimes street signs and people when they are close enough. We drove down this narrow, hilly road, and on the descent down a hill, the car makes a strange sound. Kathy starts braking, and we get to the bottom of the hill. The car quits working. Kathy swears and turns on the hazard lights. She and I get out of the vehicle and help pop the hood, which causes a bunch of smoke to fly out. After the smoke mostly clears, Kathy tries to figure out what went wrong this time. We stand in the dark for at least 45 minutes, maybe longer before we realized she couldn't fix the car and needed a tow truck. These were the days of the MapQuest printouts and brick phones, so we couldn't whip out our smartphone and look up the closest tow truck. 
I decided to call my boyfriend Caleb to come pick us up and suggest we come with a tow truck to pick up the car when it was daylight. May and Kathy agree, so I take out my cruddy Nokia and call my boyfriend. It's then I realize no service. I ask May and Kathy if either of them have service. They both check and shake their heads. May gets a bit panicky and we all hold our phones up, trying to get a signal to no avail. It's really hot and after failing to get any kind of service, we are all feeling a bit spooked and uncomfortable. May begs us to do something because she is more afraid than Kathy and I. Kathy attempts to calm May down and I wonder if the thick woods and hills are blocking out our reception. I tell May and Kathy to wait by the car and walk away from them up the hill we had just come down, holding my phone out. Still no signal. I walk further and further away until I reach the top of the hill. I can't see the outline of our car anymore, but I can still hear May at a distance. Even at the top of the hill, I don't get a signal. I know it's gotta be the trees in the way, so I get the idea of climbing up a tree and calling from there, just to see if it works. In hindsight, this was not my brightest idea, but me being an idiot. I saunter off into the woods in search of a climbable tree. At this point, I just wanna go home, and this is the only thing on my mind. I find a nice tree with low branches and lift my body upwards towards the trunk. I climb the branches higher and higher and about midway up the tree, I feel my pack of cigarettes fall out of my shorts pocket. I'm kind of annoyed, but figured I can just look for them when I climb back down. I take my phone out and hold it up once I get near the top. I have service. Relieved, I call Caleb, but he doesn't pick up, so I call again until he does. He answers in a sleepy but pissed voice, but I'm having none of that and simply explain our situation. He asks where we are, and I give him the name of the road and my best guess as to how far along we are on it. He says he will be on his way and tells me to go back and wait with May and Kathy, then he yells at me for being stupid and climbing a tree in the dark with my bad depth perception. I assure him that I'm fine, he's skeptical but says okay, and we hang up. I start climbing down the tree, but my hand touches a big glob of sap, so I stop and try to wipe the sticky goop off of my shirt. I'm already sweaty and gross, so I'm not too happy about the sap. While I'm failing at getting rid of this crud off my hands, I hear the strangest sound from somewhere below me. Swish, swish, swish. I completely freeze, not being able to place what the sound is, but it's moving pretty fast. I stare down into the darkness below me, but can't see anything. Just hear this noise continuing. It comes closer and closer, and then I hear it right below my tree. Swish. And then it stops, right under my tree. I hold onto the branches as tight as I can and wait. I hear leaves shuffling and twigs snapping, and after a while that stops, and the weird noise starts again, but it's heading away from me deeper into the woods. I wait until I can no longer hear the sound, then finish climbing down and jump out of the tree. It's completely silent now, besides the sounds of the woods, so I grew up around on the ground for my cigarettes. I don't find them, so I make my way out of the woods and back towards the road. I jog down the hill, and when I reach the bottom, I notice May and Kathy are not standing outside the car anymore, and the hazard lights are off. I walk over to the car and May rolls on the window a little bit and whispers in a panicked voice, Elizabeth, where were you? I point back over my shoulder towards the hill and started to explain that I called her brother, but Kathy yelled, what are you doing? Get back in the car. I give them a weird look, but Maya unlocks and opens the door and I crawl into the back seat with her, slamming it behind me. Kathy slams the locks and double checks them while May rolls up the window and makes sure the rest are rolled up. One of the windows has never closed all the way, but there's less than a finger space so it's not too big of a deal, but May's freaking out about it and Kathy has lost her cool as well. I am still confused and ask what the heck is going on. Maya tells me that a bit after I went up the hill, some weird person came out of the woods and ran really funny up the hill in the direction I went. They got freaked out and turned the lights off and got in the car. They thought he had got me. I am honestly scared at this point because if I hadn't stopped to wipe sap off my hands, I most likely would have got out of the tree at the time I heard the weird noise. I just knew it was that person. I tell them my story, and everybody in the car is super scared, but are relieved that Caleb is on his way. We only have to play the waiting game now. We sit on the road for what seems like forever. The dread we were feeling made time seem like it was going slower than normal. Kathy and May are looking out the windows, surveying the area, and I'm just sitting there hoping Caleb will hurry up and come rescue us. Suddenly, I hear May whine, what is that, and she starts crying. Kathy snaps her head to where May is looking and stifles a gasp. I look where they are facing, I see nothing but the dark, but then I hear it through the small opening in the window, swish, swish, swish. May ducks down, as though doing that will make her invisible, and Kathy hides her head behind the steering wheel. I follow their lead and sort of hunch down at my seat, but the noise comes straight up to the window. I can almost make out the silhouette of a tall, skinny man, and then he presses his face against May's window, and I finally see him. Nobody screams, you'd think we would, but it didn't happen. We all just stared at each other. He looks in at us for a while until Kathy switches her brights on hoping it would scare him off, but it did nothing. 
the dude just walked to the front of the car and stood in front of the headlights. Maybe he thought he could block us from leaving, I don't know. I couldn't make out his features very well, but the guy had to be somewhere a bit over 6 feet and no older than 30 years old. He had the face of your average Joe, nothing special. Nothing really sinister or particularly creepy that you notice about him if you run into this dude in broad daylight. Dark shaved hair, pale skin, long face. May said he had light colored eyes and stubble with eyebrows that made him look like he was always concerned. But there was no way I could make that out, so I had to take her word for it. What was really weird was it was like 80 degrees, and this dude was wearing corduroys, which is what the sound was, corduroys making that swishy sound when you walk, and an oversized sweater with abnormally long sleeves. The sleeves went over his hands and flopped back and forth as he paced around in front of the car. I'm not sure how long he was in front of the car, but it was a while. Then good old Corduroy starts doing something really bizarre. He bends his arms up towards his face, which I can only describe as looking like a praying mantis because of the way his sleeves were hanging, and then he begins walking circles around the car, rhythmically taking two steps forward, one step back like Willy Wonka but on speed or something. This is where I noticed the swish sound matched up exactly to the same sound I heard when I was back in the tree. He was doing the two steps forward, one step back in the woods, when he was going after me, as though this wasn't weird enough. By now, May was sobbing and Kathy seemed like she had to vomit, so I felt like I had to be the brave one. I looked at the slight space in the open window, and when he orbited his way over there, I said, hey man, can you just stop? You're really freaking us out. Corduroy definitely had heard me, so he switched to a halt and looked back into the car through the windshield, straight at me. I asked him very firmly to leave, but he took an extended pause, smiled, then Willy Wonka would his way out of my line of vision into the darkness. After a while, Kathy said he disappeared into the woods, and May was like, I can't believe that worked. We awkwardly laughed about what a weirdo he was and glad he left and whatever, and we went back to waiting for Caleb, somewhat reassured, but still paranoid. But after some time, Kathy said, oh no, he's back. I couldn't see, but apparently he was doing this two steps forward, one step back parallel to us on the side of the road, and this time he had a big tree branch he was holding with his sweater covered hands. May got scared again, and I held her hand so she'd feel better about it, even though I was ready to piss myself. It was awful, because I didn't know if he was coming towards us, or if he was moving away, or whatever he was up to. It was kinda like when you knew there was gonna be a jump scare in a horror movie. Then I hear Corduroy switch back towards the Geo and on my window. He smacks it with the tree branch. May and I panic, and I scoot as close to her as possible. They see the dude back up into the woods, then come running back and slamming the branch back into my window, like he's jousting with no horse. Thankfully, the window didn't break. But it got terrifying hearing swish, 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 clonk after a while, and he did this repetitively. Kathy perks up in her seat and starts pointing at the road ahead. I see headlights. She blares the horn and flashes the lights. Lo and behold, it's our savior, Caleb. He brought his older brother, Alex, and they both get out of his car and head over to us. May's sobs turn into joy's laughter as her brothers approach. Now Caleb and Alex have always been tall guys. Walking around with them was like walking around with high elves. It felt very safe. Caleb was 6 foot 8 and Alex is around 6 foot 5, so I thought two dudes taller than the corduroy jouster would make him leave, but nope. Caleb walks towards corduroy, trying to assess the situation, and Alex comes over to the car and taps on the window, tells Kathy to get out. She does and he walks over to his car, then he comes back and puts the car in neutral so he can push it off to the side of the road. May and I slowly get out and May makes a bolt for her brother's car. I help Alex push the car to the side while Caleb distracts the corduroy jouster by holding the end of his stick and telling him to go away. Corduroy yanks the branch away from Caleb and starts backing up by going two steps backward, one step forward, and disappears into the darkness down the street. I can't see him, but Caleb can. The dude backs up pretty far and then comes launching at Caleb who sprints the other way down the road, cause that stick could have really hurt him. He bumps past Alex, who had already got out of the car and was opening his car door, leaving me behind the car alone. Corduroy apparently changed directions and aimed the stick at me, but I couldn't really tell. I just hear everybody shout, Elizabeth. This startles me, and I jump to the side of the car, hearing Corduroy smash the stick into the back window with a loud thud and a swish. I take the long way around the car and sprint off into the road and feel Caleb grab my arm and tug me over Alex's car. I feel the wind has been knocked out of me and my legs don't seem to work. But Caleb manages to shove me in the back seat and scrambles into the passenger side. By now we are all safely in the car and Corduroy is standing like a mantis in front of the headlights again. He had abandoned his stick and just stood there with no intention to move. Alex puts the car into reverse and slams on the gas, making me knock my head against the door. Then makes the sloppiest U-turn ever and nearly drives us into the woods but gets us back onto the road. Everybody was in 100% panic mode as Alex tore away, far over whatever the speed limit was. 
Me and Kathy swear they saw Corduroy chasing behind us after Alex made the U-turn, but there was no way he was catching up. The next day, I went back there with Caleb, Kathy, and the dude from the tow truck place. There was no sign of Corduroy anymore, but when we approached the car, we saw that in the space where the window didn't close all the way were my cigarettes. The box was missing, but they were all neatly jammed in a row along the window space. I have no doubt it was the work of the corduroy jouster. To this day, I wonder if he knew I was up the tree and took my cigarettes, or if he thought I dropped them and went further into the woods to look for me, or if he just found them later and decided to stick them through the window, because he was weird. I also still wonder what his intentions were. I still have so many unanswered questions on that night. Several years ago, I was in a bit of a financial pickle. I was 21 with a bad job history, a bad job, and bad credit. My living situation went sideways, and I had temporarily moved back home with my folks. As anyone who has ever had to move back home as an adult will tell you, this was a terrible situation. I was a rush to get back out on my own, which is why when my best friend, similar position in life at the time, told me that an apartment had opened up at her shady complex, I had actually jumped at it. If you're from around here, then you'll know that every apartment complex in that town is kind of shady. But for those of you who are not here, this place is a shady non-town outside of another non-town, with more liquor stores than any other establishment, and several apartment complexes with no credit checks and same-day move-ins. A couple of months went by, and while the cops did occasionally show up in our parking lot and you had to watch your step for more than one broken bottle, it wasn't the worst place to live. I worked the night shift at a large retailer, shuffling around freight in the back, hating every minute of every shift. So one night, while I trudged up and down a ladder like a zombie at work, my cell phone fell out of my back pocket at the top of the ladder. I grabbed at it, obviously missing, and died a little as I saw it smack the ground and go black. No amount of restarting or shaking could fix it. The LCD was completely shot. Well that's just great, I thought to myself, and decided this was a good enough reason to go home mid-shift. Remember that thing I said about bad job history? Yeah, you can clearly see why. Driving home, at 3am on some random weekday, I turned onto the dark back road that led to my apartment building. I saw something faintly up ahead, in the road, and immediately think it's someone's dog. I pulled up slower, praying that I wasn't coming up on someone's dead pet, and saw that there was actually a teenage boy laying on the side of the road waving. There was a bike laying in the dirt next to him. The kid saw me and jumped, weaving toward the driver's side of my car. Now, I may have made a lot of poor decisions at this point in my life, but thankfully, I hadn't gone completely brain dead. I locked the car doors, but cracked the driver's side window. Are you okay? What happened? Let me get some help. I got hit by a car. They left me. I need help. The kid looked dazed and was cuffed up, but something about him also set my nerves on edge. I'm gonna call for help, okay? I grabbed up my cell phone and then remembered the thing was basically useless due to its ladder plunge. My cell phone was broke, but I live nearby there, okay? I will get help. I hope he didn't think I was lying, but then I didn't care. The kid slammed his hand against my car. Just let me in. I need help now. I promise. I will get help and come back. Everything will be okay. I felt torn. I wasn't going to let this kid into my car, but at the same time, I couldn't blame him. If I was scared and hurt, I would probably be frantic too. The kid slammed his hand against the car again, and I started driving. I hadn't been exaggerating. It was a 30 second drive to my apartment. I didn't have a landline, and I didn't want to somehow lead this kid to my empty apartment with no way of calling for help. I saw my best friend's boyfriend's car parked in her spot, and immediately was thankful for the stroke of luck. I ran up the steps to her apartment and began banging on the door. Roy answered the door, probably expecting a crazy person, and was immediately even more alarmed to see me. What is going on? Why aren't you at work? I breathlessly explained that some kid had been hit by a car off the back road, but my cell isn't working, and that I needed him to come back with me. Melanie, my best friend, emerged from her room, sleepy and equally confused. Roy immediately took charge, told us both to get into the car, and drove us back to the boy. The kid was still there, waving us down. Roy, a large man, Mel, and myself all got out of the car. Help. I need help. I'm here to help. My friend saw you and came and got me, okay? Calm down. I got jumped by this gang man. They beat me up and stole my backpack and rode off. The kid said frantically. I immediately became alarmed. That's not what he told me at all. I looked at Mel, my face clouding over. I thought you got hit by a car. Why did the gang jump you? What? Yeah, they beat me up and then someone hit me with a car. Plausible. I was still confused though. Roy also seemed very wary of this change in the story. Listen man, let me call an ambulance, okay? Can you tell me your name? The kid lost it. He screwed his face up and clenched his fist, hitting the side of his head. No, 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 no. Just let me in the car, man. Just take me to your house. Roy was done. That's not happening, kid. I'll call an ambulance, and the police, and I can wait with you till they get here, but we can't bring you back with us. 
The kid slapped the side of his head some more, and then in the most disturbing thing I've ever seen, grabbed fistfuls of his shaggy hair and began pulling it out of his scalp. The sound is still the most disgusting and alarming thing I've ever heard. Roy gave Mel and I the, let's get out of here face, and we jumped back in the car. I'm calling the police, okay? I will tell them you've been hurt and you need an ambulance. Roy began dialing, and the kids started stomping around and screaming. Take me to your house, just let me get in the car, why won't you take me home? The kid stood in the street, blood trickling from where he'd torn up his scalp. Roy got back in the driver's seat and spoke with the cops as the kid raged outside. He then came to the window, staring so intently at us that I felt like my skin had shriveled up and fallen off. He began kicking the tires, and Roy, clearly over it, drove off. The kid grabbed me frantically at the back of the car. Roy drove past our return, around Peters Creek twice to avoid leading the kid to the apartment complex, and then back down our road. The kid was gone. The bike, the kid, just gone. No idea where he took off to. Clumps of his hair were still on the road. We never saw the kid again. We searched the papers and internet to see if he'd been picked up, or if any other strange things had taken place that night, but nothing else ever showed up. What confuses me still about all of it is why he would demand to come back with all three of us. One person could obviously be easily overtaken, but what were his plans for all three of us? In the early 80s, when I was 8, my family was visiting my uncle who lived in Backwoods, Missouri. He lived on a lot of land, and the only other people who really even lived on the street were relatives, so no one else ever just happened to be there. This meant no one ever really locked their doors, because random family members were always coming by for this or that. One night, while we were all there, my parents and aunt and uncle decided to go to a nearby town to go bowling, because bowling. My brothers, who were 11 and 12, my female cousins, 6 and 14, and I'm female, stayed home. It was still daylight when the adults left, but it started raining pretty hard and got dark quickly. We used to play this game that was essentially hide and seek in the dark house, but we called it Vampire. There was a thin little mattress on the living room floor that some of the kids would sleep on at night, so the person who was it would lie on the mattress and fold it over themselves like a coffin and count down to midnight. When they got to midnight, they were looking for you, again, all the lights are off, and you try to make it back to the coffin before you got caught. Because the house was in the country, it was pitch black at night. You couldn't see your hand in front of your face. What this meant for the game was that, one, you couldn't tell where the vampire was looking, so you just had to make a break for it, and two, if you were extremely lazy, and I'm sure by now you can guess which one of us met those standards, you could hide in the living room with the coffin and get to base quickly. Ben, my 11 year old brother was it and was doing the normal countdown. I was hiding maybe 6 feet from him. As he's counting, there was a flash of lightning. I don't know if I was already looking at the living room window or if the lightning made me look, but with the backlight of the lightning, I see a man with his face against the window. He had his hands on each side of his face as if he's trying to peer in and looks exactly like the stereotypical creepster. Heavy set, scraggly beard, etc. I could feel every hair on my body standing on end. Immediately, I began trying to convince myself that I didn't see what I saw, but then Ben sternly whispered, if anyone is hiding in here, stay still. I sort of croaked out a, I'm here, right as there was another flash of lightning. Creepster was still there, but was no longer trying to look in the window. Instead, he was now looking toward the front door. Ben and I immediately knew what was coming next. From where he was standing, Creepster was probably only 5 feet from the front door. Ben was the same distance, but there was a couch between him and the door. Ben leapt over the couch and locked the door right as Creepster started trying the handle. At this point, I guess Ben decided that it was best to let the Creepster know that people were home and that we knew he was there, because he flipped on the porch light and then started turning on the lights in the house. This is going to sound weird, but I was too terrified to panic. Having said that, I was relying completely on Ben to know and tell me what to do. He told me to go lock the other doors and was yelling for everyone else to come out and to lock all the windows. Honestly, the next few minutes were hazy in my mind. I remember everything up until this point extremely clearly. Then I remember the end very clearly, but I'm less clear about the middle. I know that I locked the side door and then the sliding glass door in the back of the house. When we talked about it over the years, some people remember us seeing him out the back door as well. I don't think I remember that. What I clearly recall is locking the sliding glass door and standing there frozen and hearing Ben in a very calm but firm voice say, close the curtain, listen to me, okay, close the curtain. So I did. Ben can't remember that part and I just remember my fear in Ben's voice, so I'm not sure if I saw the creepster in the backyard or not. We tried to call the police, but my aunt and uncle had a stupid party line and it wouldn't work, either from the storm or from a neighbor leaving it off the hook or whatever. For the second, they are the only people I've ever known with a party line, so this wasn't normal to me either. But for those of you who don't know what that is, in really rural areas, multiple people on the street would actually share a phone line would have different rings for different households, but you could pick up on the phone 
and listen to your neighbor's conversation. We also tried to summon help on my uncle's CB radio, but couldn't reach anyone. My uncle was a hunter, so he had a gun rack full of rifles in his room, but my older cousin was on an out-of-town hunting trip and took them with him. All we could find was a BB gun that looked like a real rifle. I vividly remember Ben putting me on phone duty and Scott, my older brother, on CB duty, while he stood watch at the little square window on the front door with a BB gun. Maybe 30 minutes later, Ben said, He's back. He's coming up the driveway. The rest of us froze in fear, but Ben opened the front door and stepped out on the porch, pointed the gun and said, Get out of here right now. Then we hear our cousin Kyle, who lived on the road a bit, say, You know that's a BB gun, right? Even though Kyle was only 15, I remember that we felt like we had been saved when he showed up. Kyle seemed really skeptical of our story, like we were playing a trick on him, even though we had no idea that he was coming, but he stayed with us until our parents came home. Honestly, I don't remember if we even told our parents what happened when they got home. There was definitely no police involvement though. We just went on with our trip, but we never played vampire again without some mention of that night. Alright, so that's it. I hope you enjoyed this compilation. Let me know down in the comments below if you want to hear another one of these compilations every once in a while. But as always, have a nice day.